All right. Um, so I'm Stephen Wittens, and I'm not a mathematician. I kind of just play one on the internet. Uh, and this is my website, Acro.net, which got a little bit of publicity in the beginning of the year, and it was slightly controversial uh, on account of it being in 3D. Um, and the thing is, this is kind of an homage to the over-the-top ridiculous websites from the 90s, like Fong.com. Uh, earlier, we had the question, why would you ever want a website in 3D on a Nintendo DS? I agree, it's, it's ridiculous. It's, it's completely useless. Um, but so here today, I'm, I'm ready to talk about math. And the, the reason math is in the header of my website is because it's uh, really been a constant theme in my work. Uh, and, and this whole design is kind of linear algebra, geometry, uh, matrix math coming together to do some uh, pretty nifty things. And the nice thing is once you take a, a mathematical approach uh, to your work, you really get a lot of flexibility and power out of it. You can do some really impressive things like this, and it kind of just comes out naturally. Uh, and so that's kind of what we're going to talk about. Uh, now, to start with, I want to start with some quotes to kind of set the, the tone where I'm coming from philosophically, because I know math is not a sexy subject, and the premise of 40 minutes of it, I'm sure, excites you to no end. Uh, but we're going to do it anyway. Uh, first, Paul Lockhart, who's a mathematics teacher, who said, I don't see how it's doing society any good to have people walking around with vague memories of formulas and diagrams and clear memories of hating them, <laughs> which is, is absolutely true. We're, we're doing something wrong in education. This, this is not working out. Um, and the second is, you know, the, the power to understand and predict the quantities of the world should not be restricted to those with a freakish knack of manipulating abstract symbols. It, it's unfortunate that the main method through which we're introduced to math and told to operate it is through symbolic operations. Quite often, we're teaching people to be little algorithmic drones who don't actually understand what they're doing, what's going on. And so I'm hoping to kind of uh, fix that misconception by having not much code, not much formulas, but kind of just showing what's going on. Uh, and I've uh, prepared some interesting diagrams for that. So the stuff that uh, Remy mentioned was, this is the JS1K demo that I did. Uh, and in this one kilobyte of code, you've got 3D animation, you've got a 3D camera, uh, glow effects, um, and also it kind of never repeats. Uh, and despite all that, this is the code. And now, of course, this is not comprehensible, and, and I, I don't throw it up so that people could understand it, but rather to point out two things. One, this isn't a lot of code. There's, there's not much room in here, really, to do much. Uh, and second of all, all of these statements are actually quite simple. That there's, there's not a whole lot going on here, and yet somehow it manages to do something that seems uh, beyond this code. And so the question becomes, how do these pieces combine, these simple pieces, uh, to make something complex and, and interesting and novel? Um, and to really show you that, I've kind of done some interesting work. Uh, I built something new because I realized there wasn't really a tool that could do what I wanted to do and show you the things that I wanted to show you. And so it's called Mathbox, and it does some, uh, some pretty interesting things, and it should become clear soon enough what that's for. Uh, it runs on 3.js and tQuery, so the browser support is awesome, uh, obviously. And uh, the slideshow is done using deck.js, and I'm using MathJax for typesetting, which is really nice, because it makes everything look almost real. Uh, first, I'm going to start with some background, though. Where, where this really took off for me, and where I got my wings, so to speak, was in the Winamp days. I'm sure a lot of people remember this. And um, what made Winamp cool, aside from the fact that you know, it was uh, skinnable and, and, and everything, uh, was that you had these music visualizations. Uh, and one in particular, a plugin was called AVS, Advanced Visualization Studio, where you could make your own effects. And so these are a, a couple that I made. Uh, and you would plug together effects and write code to, to do custom things, including a uh, roller coaster with physics, which is music responsive uh, and, and everything. And the nice thing about this is that the whole thing is actually just drawn using lines. That there's nothing else going on. The, the, 3D is kind of faked. Um, there's no depth sorting. It's, it's all an enormous hack. But it's a really fun one and a pretty one. So that's kind of why uh, I wanted to include it. And the most interesting part about AVS was actually how real time it was. So here I'm editing some code. Just type a line, and suddenly the thing on the left turns into a starburst. Uh, type some more code. It shrinks. Uh, change the code again. Now it turns into this weird spiky fractal. Uh, and the, the 
the fact that it updates in between individual keystrokes was uh, really key to, to making this program interesting because of how it allows you to, to learn and interact with, uh, with the math. And so I kind of want to show you how that might work. You take, for example, a circle, a point moving on a circle. That's not very interesting. And you look at it from the side, it bounces up and down, and it traces out a sine wave like this, like Remy said. Um, actually, it's, it's a helix in 3D, but you look at it from the side, it's a sine wave. And so you isolate one of those sections. Uh, that's still not very interesting, I know. So you switch it around, and you switch into circular polar coordinates. Uh, and it looks like a little heart. That's a little bit better. Um, you, you take this shape, you repeat it around the circle eight times, and you get this nice little flower. Uh, and then if you're me and you're 17, you say, oh, uh, if I apply an arc sign, I can make those leaves pointy, and then I multiply it by the upside down heart, uh, and then you get something else. <laughs> Now, these days, I would probably do something slightly less offensive, like a bunny. Uh, but really what this taught me was the importance of sandboxes, the playgrounds to play around with. Because if, if math is the ultimate Lego set, uh, then, I don't know, the, the way that I always learned to play with Lego was not to take the booklet and make the race car. It was to tip all the pieces in one giant bin and then just start digging. Um, and so one of my favorite programs is uh, Grapher.app. And this is a, a huge gem that actually comes for free with every single MacBook sold, or every single Mac. Uh, and it's a really good professional graphing calculator that does latex output, does 3D, uh, tons of things. It sits for free on every Mac, and practically nobody knows about it, which is odd. Uh, and, and so the, the thing that I was doing here is kind of interesting. Uh, because it reveals what I like to call mathematics' as dirty little secret, in that everything in mathematics is a choice. Uh, in, in school, they teach you the idea that math is a ladder that you ascend, you master one subject after another. Uh, there's only one way to do it, and if you have questions, you're not quite sure, usually the teacher's kind of like the angry nun with a metal ruler who just smacks you on the finger for asking questions, um, when really asking questions is what it's all about. And, and just to show you a quick example, uh, this is a graph of, of what's called a rational function. It has uh, x in the denominator. And what that means is sometimes you'll divide by zero. And, and what that looks like in the graph is that your, your values kind of shoot up towards positive infinity and then suddenly flips around and comes around from negative infinity. Uh, and at the point in the middle, you're told that the value is undefined. Dividing by zero is, is undefined. Don't do it. Bad things will happen. And really, that's, that's kind of just a choice, um, because we can fix that. For example, if you apply a mapping function that maps the whole range of numbers onto a finite range, like this one, and it's not quite important what exactly it's doing. Um, so you, you fit this entire graph, you squished it down, and now you can wrap it around and connect it. And you end up with this continuous curve. Uh, and this shows, you know, you, you, you make up your own rules, you apply different things, uh, cool things happen, and then I plug this into 3.js, at least if it's working, and you get cool little visual demos. And so this is kind of straight from grapher.app into a GLSL shader, doing rapid prototyping uh, using mathematical tools, uh, which I, I find incredibly fun, and, and not just that, but educational. Like, you, you learn how the math works, how, how things fit together. And so when, you, when you're thinking about sandboxes, there's a couple that I want to mention. Uh, GLSL sandbox is a big one. Uh, Ricardo Cabello uh, put that online. Allows you to edit code, see effects in real time, uh, play around with it. Processing is another big one, which has a, a JavaScript port, which allows you to play with little dynamical systems. Uh, but it really doesn't have to be just visual. There we go. Uh, you can play with web audio, for example. The signal processing is, is mathematical in nature. Um, and even making games, you know, when you're making game logic, you're, you're uh, basically making a mathematical system. And there's a lot more math that could be used than you might think. And even outside software, you know, people are making, for example, 3D prints of mathematical objects, and they, they, they can be really interesting and mind-bending and certainly look cool if you put them on your desk. Uh, and if you're, if you're a maker and you're working with Arduinos, for example, um, 
you want to make a light blink in a certain pattern, that's, that's mathematical. You have to come up with, with a piece of code or a function to make that happen. Uh, and so now I kind of want to look at a couple of mathematical machines to kind of show you how they work, what's going on inside. Um, obviously, this is kind of just case studies. The, the best way for you to learn this stuff is to find your own sandbox and play around with it. Uh, I, I can only kind of show you the way and show you things that I think are cool. Uh, and the first one is the Bezier curve. Um, the, the Bezier curve is interesting. It's basically the pen tool from Illustrator. It's, it's what every single font, every single SVG file, every single EPS is made out of. Uh, and, and when you think curves in mathematics, usually that's kind of scary. But what's interesting about the Bezier curve is that you could actually construct these things entirely using pen and paper and a ruler, if you had the patience. Uh, it's a little bit tedious, but, it, but it's, it's, it's quite simple. So I, I kind of want to show you how that works. Um, but where this comes from is, is the French automotive industry in the early 60s, uh, where Paul de Castelju was a mathematician who came up with the first algorithm while, while working at uh, Citroën for these curves. And then Pierre Bézier was a uh, engineer at Renault who formalized the theory and then went on to develop the sort of first computer-aided design uh, software. And you can see, given the designs of the time, why they might have been interested in, in ways to describe curves precisely and design them in certain ways. Uh, now, to make Bezier curves, I kind of need to start with a little bit of theory, um, but I promise it's not scary. I kind of just want to, want to set the stage um, on vectors. What is a vector? When you think vector <laughs> graphics, you think curves and points, but vectors are actually arrows. And, and this is one of those statements that would get me expelled from the mathematician's clubhouse um, because they would say vectors are not arrows, but for our purposes, they are, and so, mm, them. Uh, and vectors are relative things. Uh, they, they describe a displacement, and what that means is an arrow points in a certain direction, has a certain length, and two vectors would be equal if they have the same length and they point in the same direction. So in this case, the blue and the red one, they're, they're the same vector. Uh, these two are not the same. And when you have vectors, you can do arithmetic with them, uh, sort of arrow math, if you will. Uh, you, you add two arrows together by laying them end to end and connecting the start and finish. And you can do subtraction as well when you flip a vector around 180 degrees to get the opposite, where green minus red equals blue. And not only that, but you can start multiplying things. Uh, when you add a vector to itself, for example here, I'm creating three, three times A, just by taking three blue arrows, making a long green arrow. Uh, and vice versa, I can divide the green one into three pieces to recover the, the blue one. And, and this sort of theory of vectors is really all you need to know uh, to, to do Bezier curves. And, and not only that, but I haven't really talked about how you might implement this or, or how the what the underlying structure is, we're literally just doing things with arrows on paper. And that's what makes it so fun. Like, you don't really need to know what's going on underneath. Uh, and so to start with, we're going to start with two points and make a line. Again, not that exciting, but you'll see where it goes. Uh, but there's a problem. If, if vectors are relative things, how do you identify points? Because points are, are absolute references in space. And normally in math class, this would be a, a complicated conversation, but with this crowd, I can kind of just say, position relative, position absolute. Because you just pick an origin, and then you identify points by connecting an arrow with the origin. Uh, and if you're implementing this, you use a vector math library where you identify a coordinate grid, and you take x and y coordinates, et cetera. Uh, but we're not really interested in that, because again, we're working on pen and paper. And it doesn't really matter where the origin is, because the relative differences don't change. And so to start making a line, first we need to get the vector that connects the two points, uh, which if, if you remember the little triangle from before, you can just do with subtraction. So in this case, the green vector is the red minus the blue. Uh, and now the question is, how do we access the points in the middle? And that's not that hard, because we can scale vectors. And so you scale the green vector, for example, to a third of its length. Uh, you add that to the blue vector, and now you have the point that's one third along the way. And, and this operation, which is uh, called linear interpolation, which is just you know, moving between two points, uh, is, is actually incredibly common, incredibly important, shows up everywhere. If, if you're blending two images, you're, you're you know, setting an opacity on an image or something, this is what's going on inside every single pixel. Uh, 
And, and this is the primitive that Bezier curves are made out of. Um, so let's make curves. Uh, to start with, we're gonna add a third point. And now you have two legs. And when we have two legs, it makes sense to interpolate on the second leg too. And we synchronize these two interpolations. So you get this nice little wavy effect going. And when you have two purple points, it makes sense to connect them and interpolate along them again. And now you see that the, the green point actually traces out a curve already. There we go. That's the quadratic Bezier curve, which has two stages of uh, interpolation or lerping, as it's often called, not to be confused with LARPing. And the resulting curve has two endpoints and one control point. Uh, it's not the one from Illustrator, but it, it's used already, like in fonts, for example, quadratic Bezier curves are used. Um, but we need to go one level deeper, do curve inception, add a fourth point. So we add another leg, interpolate there again, and now we have four black points being interpolated into three purple points, three purple points being interpolated into two green points, and when you have two points at the end left, well, it makes sense to connect them and interpolate again. And when you do this, you get the cubic Bezier curve, which has three stages of interpolation, uh, and has two control points as well as two endpoints. And so this whole sort of construction of uh, interpolation upon interpolation upon interpolation is, is what the curve is made out of, and it keeps working if you move the control points around. And every time you, you draw out a curve in Illustrator, this is kind of what's going on inside, uh, and, and that's pretty much how the, the primitive is designed. You, we haven't talked about formulas, we haven't talked about polynomials, any of those things. You don't really need to know that. You can just describe visually what's going on. Uh, and now the cool thing about this is um, I, I said vectors were arrows, but I didn't actually say what space they live in. Um, we all kind of assume, because we're looking at a flat screen, that we're talking about two dimensions. But the nice thing is this completely works in three dimensions too. And by moving the control points around, you create curves in three dimensions. And again, it just works. This, this is what the mathematics are doing. And if you describe it by formulas, all of this is kind of obscured. You lose sight of, of what you're trying to do. And curves in 3D are nice, but they're not that exciting. So let's go further. Uh, you take a four by four grid of points like this. And so we saw before you need four points to make a cubic Bezier curve, which means we can make four curves like this by connecting them. Um, now we're gonna be working in 3D, so it looks something like this. And when you have four curves, you can run along them just like we did before, and you get four new points, like this. And so when we have four points, it makes sense to make a Bezier curve out of them, so we do that. And now you see that this new curve is kind of tracing out a surface. Uh, and so let's make that surface. And now you have something that's called the bicubic Bezier surface. It has 16 control points, and every single control point kind of affects the shape of a surface like the control points of a, a Bezier curve would. And uh, that's kind of how the primitive works. And so these kind of things are, are what Pixar characters are made out of, or, or variations on, on these constructions, where you take a bunch of these tiny little patches and sort of stitch them together in a way that creates a continuous uh, surface. And, and this whole thing is made out of linear interpolations, just stacked in a, in a certain way. Like the, the thing at the bottom, the, the purple point moving on the line, that's all we did. We, we just stacked it, repeated it, made it happen, and out comes this crazy, random, beautiful, shaded surface that you can use to make uh, Shrek out of. I think that's cool. So that's number one. Uh, now I want to talk about procedural generation. Uh, procedural generation is, is any time you're using code to generate assets to basically replace an artist with a piece of code, because usually that's cheaper. Um, but not only that, the, the problem is that game consoles and graphics these days have become so complicated that you need to automate processes in, in order to uh, deliver your game on time and on budget. And so you can make textures and materials out of code, you can make 3D models out of code. You, you can really do uh, tons of things. I mean, make maps, um, make fractals. Anything you can imagine a piece of code can do, uh, that's procedural content generation. It's, it's not a field that's well-defined. It's, it's as vague as you can be. In fact, you could consider electronic music to be 
procedurally generated sound in a way. Uh, and so let, I, I want to show an example. Um, and so what, what I've done is kind of taken that JS1K demo from the beginning with the swirling things and the glow and, and simplified it a little bit so you can see what's going on. Uh, and so it looks kind of like this. You have this sphere and these points that are moving on it and these tendrils that shoot out of it. Uh, and it looks cool and, and confusing and it's hard to see what's going on. So if you isolate one strand, you can kind of see better. It's just sort of a point that's moving along the surface of the sphere and it's sweeping a tail behind it. Uh, so let's, let's figure out how that works. We unwrap the sphere. Uh, so th this is mapping latitude, longitude to a grid and, and height on the sphere into the, the third dimension. Uh, and it looks like this. And it, it kind of looks like the blue curve has some sort of physics going on that makes it sweep around. Um, and that's one of those procedural tricks where you completely fake it. Because if I extend this tendril, you can see that it's actually just sort of being extruded outwards. It's, it's shifting. There, there's no actual simulation going on. It's just a, a, a wavy formula, really. And so the, the problem of making tendrils shoot out of a sphere has been reduced to two things. One is the longitude coordinate, which is a graph that looks like this. And the other is the latitude component, which looks like that. And the, the question becomes, how do you calculate these things? And the answer is, you throw together a bunch of random shit. <laughs> There's no reason to this. This is just sort of a random component of, of stuff that I throw together, where one end you put in time, and on the other end out comes longitude, and similar for latitude. Uh, and it seems like a black art, and you don't quite know what's going on. Um, but there's a, uh, there's a couple ways to, to look at this and explain this, and it really all comes down to the variable x. x is the bane of many students' existence. <laughs> And, and quite often we're taught to think of x as the unknown number, some, some solution to be found. Uh, but quite often it's much better to think of x as all possible numbers. And the question then becomes, what happens to those numbers when you plug them into your formula? What comes out the other end? Uh, and so you have to do this kind of weird quantum superposition of all your numbers, which sounds horribly complicated. But no, actually we're just making graphs. That's, that's what graphs are for. It's examining what happens to the whole set of numbers when you do things to them. And so here I've graphed the function that does nothing, i.e. x return x, and it looks like a diagonal of points where every point is just mapped onto the same uh, y coordinate as the x coordinate. And this isn't, again, very interesting, but this is important because this is the neutral position. This, this is you know, the function that does nothing that looks like a diagonal. Now, of course, when you're working in mathematics, quite often you're working with real numbers instead of just integers. So we're gonna need a little bit more room and just connect the whole thing. And then you write it out and it looks like that. And now the, the point is that anything you do to your formula has a consequence of the, uh, on the graph. Every operation you do has a certain predictable effect. Uh, for example, if I divide x by two in my function, the slope is reduced by a factor of two. Uh, if I add one to the function, it goes up by one unit. Although actually, if you thought that it just moved to the left by two units instead, in this case, that's exactly the same, and that reflects a certain symmetry in the formula, where if you take the one and you put it on top of the denominator, that becomes x plus two divided by two, which means you shifted it left by two units. And, and so the gist of it is that anything you do to a function is kind of sculpting the shape in, in a mathematical space. It's sort of Photoshop layer blending, but with numbers. And that's, that's a lie, really, because Photoshop layer blending is this, but with pixels. <laughs> this is the real stuff. Um, and so we, we can do some more things. Like here you take a, an arc tangent, which looks like this, and it, it, it's not quite important what that represents or what it is. What matters is that it's a shape that starts low, goes up in a sort of S-bend, and then flattens out again. Uh, and I now take a second function, which is a sine wave. The question is, what does it look like when you add them together? And it looks like this. And there's two ways of looking at this. One is that the curve of the arc tangent was shaped by the sine wave by making it ripply, 
Or you could say that the sine wave was actually shifted up and down to follow the curve of the arc tangent. And that the two ways of looking at it reflect the fact that A plus B equals B plus A in most cases. Uh, we won't get into the cases where that's not true. Um, and we could do more things. Uh, now, you, you might be thinking that this means that you have to come up sort of with the one formula to rule them all. And that's not true at all, because you, you have a lot of freedom as to, to how you treat these formulas. For example, if you apply a minimum maximum operator, you can isolate a section of a cosine to create this sort of uh, cosine bump. And this is called a, a window function, because it's, it's zero everywhere except in the, in the middle. So uh, this is a very useful tool to use. Uh, for, for example, suppose I have a fractal, and it doesn't really matter what it is in this case. It's, it's just something I, I made up. Uh, and I made it tunable so that there, there's two parameters, x and t, t for time. And as time evolves, the, the fractal changes. Just to show that I can make infinite variations of this one primitive. And now if I multiply this by this window function, you get this section of fractal that tapers out at the edges. And this is a very useful primitive because you can use it sort of as a, a brush. For example, suppose you take three of these things and, and one of them is negative, uh, one is stretched out, one is vertically stretched out, uh, and you add them together, you see that you've sort of sculpted a little nice landscape and, and you have full control over where you put the things. You don't really have full control over what the fractal itself is doing other than tuning the knob on, on the parameter. Uh, but, it, but it shows how you, know, you, can, you can take mathematical primitives and combine them in a way that does allow for artist control. So artists aren't, aren't entirely obsolete, just not yet. And this technique uh, isn't just you know, some esoteric example that I just came up with, uh, because you can do this, for example, on spheres as well. Uh, you, you can apply a, a, a bump here to push the surface up. You can apply one there to sort of mix and create this, this irregular shape. You can apply a crater in the middle. And, and this technique is actually what was used by Spore, the, the Maxis game, to create little cartoony planets, uh, which was incredibly powerful and novel and just worked on commodity hardware. And, and certainly for me, this was a very impressive tech demo. I, I looked up the paper on how they did it, uh, and then I wanted to make my own version of it, so I kind of did. Only I, I wasn't really interested in, in candy cane planets, uh, so I try to make it realistic, and, and this is what it ended up uh, not looking like. There we go. And so you see this is this sort of rocky asteroid that has fractal levels of detail as you zoom in. Uh, I hope you can see that clearly. Uh, you can just move around, uh, get in really close. You get these nice little lines which look like they're totally deliberate. They're not, those are rounding errors, but I kept them because they look interesting. <laughs> and here I, I put in uh, a big crater. Uh, you can zoom in, there, there's tons of detail there. And really, if, if the precision issues weren't there, I could zoom in way more. There's, there's no reason why I couldn't, other than the fact that it was limited by the, the memory on the GPU and the precision of the numbers I was using. Um, so there you go, an entire planet made out of math. And finally, uh, I want to talk a little bit about physics, because physics, uh, or physics engines, are just way too much fun to play with. Um, you take this arrangement of blobs and, and circles, it doesn't look very interesting, until you add physics, and now they bounce. And now we can invert gravity, and they go up and down, let them fall down again, do that again. And there's something interesting that's going on which is that all the white circles ended up on top, and, and that's not an accident. If, if you take a bag of sand and you put a couple of like screws in it, you shake it around really thoroughly, eventually the screws sink to the top. And so th this kind of shows that you, you make a physics engine, it, it acts correctly, it does the right thing, without you really uh, deliberately programming in that behavior. It's, it's very emergent, and that's what makes them so fun. And the nice thing about physics engines, too, is that they're really easy to make. But they're tantalizing things in a way that it's really hard to make a good one. Uh, and so if you're ever trying to make a game, ever trying to uh, do something with physics, you'll want to just use something like Box2D, uh, 
where you take something off the shelf and make it work. But if you want to understand what's going on, make your own physics engine. It, it's fun and it's really easy. And I'm going to show you how that works. At least once these balls are done dropping. There we go. Uh, so your, your basic physics engine has two things in it. First is, where is everything? Which is a position of, of your objects or particles or, or whatever it is that you're simulating. And the second part is, what is it doing? Which in this case is a direction of motion, a, a velocity. And you can see that both of these things are vectors. It seems like speed should just be a number, but in physics, uh, they talk about velocity because you want to describe both where it's going and how fast it's going. So that's what makes it a vector. And the, the purpose of the physics engine is then to say, if this is the situation that we start out with, what's the situation like in the future, whether it's a second in the future, two seconds in the future, et cetera. And if you assume, for example, that this velocity is expressed in meters per second, uh, and I know I'm in the UK and I'm not quite sure how metric you are these days, um, <laughs> but that's your problem. Uh, then one second into the future, this little ball is gonna have moved there. It's quite easy. And half a second in the future from that point, we can find that too, just by shrinking the velocity by a factor of two, and then moving that point ahead by half a second. And if you do this with small enough time steps, you end up with continuous motion, like this. Uh, and you can see that I've implemented a, a little bit of collision where it bounces off the edges. And unfortunately, it's stuttering a little bit, which is, that's what happens when you work with experimental web technologies. Uh, but the collision, and coll collision in general is a really hard problem with a capital H, but in this case, it's quite easy because all I'm doing is flipping the velocity vector around vertically or horizontally whenever it touches the edge, uh, and that's all you need to do to, to make an object move around. Now, even in space, objects actually generally don't move in straight lines because there's always something tugging on it, so we need to figure that out. And that's not that hard because uh, the same way that velocity tugs on position, uh, forces tug on velocity, or rather acceleration does. And, and this is one of those uh, Newton's laws of motion where if you push a one kilogram object and you push a 10 kilogram object with the same force, obviously the heavy weight isn't quite gonna go as far. So in order to apply a force, you need to divide it by the mass, uh, and that gives you what's called the acceleration, which is another vector. And so in this case, I'm, I'm simulating gravity, and I'm, I'm cheating because I'm just saying gravity always points down, so I'm pretending I'm on a very large planet uh, where the center of, of gravity is always just below as opposed to a, a fixed point. And now we're gonna apply the force into this model. Uh, and so to do that, we move the acceleration there so we can see what's going on. And to move the object into the future, Again, I'll take a third of a second, for example. Uh, we move the position along the velocity vector, just like before. But now we do the same to the velocity vector by moving it a third along the acceleration. And now this looks kind of jumbled, but remember that vectors are relative things. It doesn't matter where they start, only how long they are and where they point. So this situation is actually the same as this. And now we actually have the physics engine already. This, this is all we need to do, because watch. If, if we keep doing this process, advancing by little time steps, little time steps, you see the acceleration tugs on the velocity, the velocity tugs on the position, and it traces out an arc, just like an object would when you throw a ball in a gravity field. And you do it in small enough time steps, uh, it just sort of works. And like I said, this is a full physics engine, it doesn't look like it, um, but you take, for example, uh, springs. And springs are governed by something called Hooke's Law. It doesn't quite matter what that does. Uh, what that means, though, is that the force that either pushes the spring outwards or inwards is directly proportional to how much you've disturbed it away from its equilibrium. So we take this spring, which at this point is at its equilibrium, and now I give it a tug, it's going to start doing this. And, and you can see, you know, the, the acceleration is the, the response of the spring to, to being displaced, tugs on the velocity, the green vector, the velocity tugs on the position, and out comes a, a spring that bounces. And what's kind of interesting about this is all the formulas that 
we've used for this physics engine until now are, are simple vector addition and, and scaling. There's, there's nothing more complicated going on about this. And yet, if you were to graph the motion of the endpoints, you would find that it describes a perfect sine wave that's, that's contracting uh, and, and expanding at a regular period in a completely regular shape. And, and it shows the emergent properties of, of physics engines, because despite the fact that we're just adding little time steps together and, and we're not really doing anything more advanced, somehow we've managed to solve what's called a differential equation that has the sine wave as, as its solution. And so you take these springs, for example, you make a, a construction like this out of it, it, it kind of just works. And you give it a nudge, it flies away and bounces. Uh, and and that's, that's really all, all you need to do to make a physics engine and, and incorporate any physical law you find. You just sort of plug in the right formula and, and go to town. That said, I, I've kind of just completely lied. Uh, the thing is, uh, this physics engine is not stable. In, in each of the demos that I just did, I kind of incorporated a teeny tiny friction force of air resistance that slows everything down just enough so that it doesn't spiral out of control. And, and let me show you why that happens. Uh, in this case, for example, I have a pretend it's Earth orbiting the sun in a circular or almost circular orbit like this. Uh, and it has a velocity like that that's tangential to the circle. Now, if you, if you were to start doing the, the sort of physics simulation that we just did, uh, you would find that you're actually just completely stepping off the orbit of the planet. This is, this is not right. And if you kept on doing this, you find that you spiral outwards and your solar system flies apart and the poor little creatures living on Earth freeze to death in the cold vacuum of space. <laughs> that's not nice. And you could try to reduce the time step to try and mitigate this effect, but it doesn't fix the problem, it just reduces it. And not only that, but you get rapidly diminishing returns. Uh, and so to solve this problem, you really need to wield the hammer of calculus, which involves scary looking symbols like that, which I won't get into today, um, and, and it involves more sophisticated solvers that you can look up. And, and one that's often used, for example, is verlet integration, uh, which powers almost all simple physics games. Uh, you can look up the formulas, you plug them in, you end up with a system that is stable, that doesn't spiral out of control, your springs don't magically start vibrating when they shouldn't, uh, everything works. And so that's kind of physics engines in, in five minutes, I guess. Uh, this picture is uh, Achilles and the tortoise, and, and that relates to calculus, because calculus is the art of uh, taking infinitely small steps. When, when you look at this little graph, it seems like the only way you could get a perfect circle is, is if you took infinitely small steps so that you never step off the circle, which seems like that's, that doesn't make sense. It didn't make sense to the ancient Greeks. That's why they came up with this story uh, that's properly referred to, referred to as Zeno's paradox. Um, and it took until Newton to, to really solve this uh, mathematically. It involves lots of pages of proofs and, and formulas that you need to apply. But it is, without a doubt, the most powerful mathematical tool that we have. It powers everything in modern engineering. Uh, really, everything in the sciences, physics, uh, chemistry, it's, it's all based on, on this ability to chop things up into infinitely small pieces and somehow have it make sense. Uh, that's pretty much all I have to show today. I just want to leave you with a couple of references, things to look at. Uh, this one's actually super new. It was posted last week, and I, I jumped into the air when I saw it. It's called natureofcode.com, and it's an entire free online ebook uh, with examples in processing.js that does pretty much what I just did, only way more thorough, uh, way more in depth. Uh, it, it's, it's an amazing resource. Go check it out. Another one is the, the YouTube channel Vihart, and she is like the math teacher that you wish you had, uh, where she takes her notebook and her pencil and Sharpies and starts doodling in math class, uh, although you wonder kind of how she snuck the camera in without the teacher noticing, uh, and does amazing things, really, really amazing things. Uh, she even at one point makes uh, Mexican food out of mathematical origami where she puts on the guacamole and then folds the taco and somehow the guacamole disappears. 
without spilling out. It, it's, it's an amazing magic trick, and it's a, a lesson in topology. Uh, there's also Kill Math by Brett Victor, who talks about abstraction, what's wrong with math. Uh, this is one of the persons, uh, people who, whose quote I used in the beginning. Uh, amazing visualizations, and, uh, amazing insights. Um, and finally, betterexplained.com, which is the math textbook that you wish you had in school uh, that has all the, well, better explanations. That's, that's what it is. It's amazing. Thank you very much.